So I hope you all enjoyed the first talk I did. And I have some, some thoughts to add to that. I actually have a number of slides that sort of directly connect to some of the stuff that Manuel said. So um, hopefully that's going to add something to the discussion. Originally, my topic, though, was and still is the a taxonomy of microservices, which is a little more technical, but I always somehow seem to touch on the organizational aspects of things. Maybe that's because I don't because I no longer know tech that well. Who knows? Maybe it's just because it's the mo more important part. We'll see. So um, my name is Stefan Tilkov. I'm from a company called InnoQ. We basically most of the time do software architecture consulting and software development. Um, we're based in Germany and Switzerland, and um, we do a lot of microservices. We do a lot of projects where uh, there's microservices are supposed to be used and then are not. We do a lot of projects where people claim that what they do is microservices, but it isn't. And when we use microservices, we're never 100% sure whether they actually merit the name or not. So that inspired this talk about what actually is it that we mean when we talk about microservices. It seems that everybody's has agreed now that that is the way to go forward. That is the way to create systems these days. You have to use a microservices architecture. But I do think that um, while there are some things that everybody agrees on that sort of are certain truths about microservices architecture, there are a lot of things where people's opinions differ. So let me start first with what I think is the stuff we can agree on, right? So. I think there are some common traits, some things that people you know, tend to believe. Like a microservice is focused on one thing. People don't really say what they mean by that, but they say it's like, you know, like the Unix way. If you do one thing and do that one thing well, which sounds awesome and I like, the, I like that approach. It smells of simplicity, which I like a lot, so that's a good thing. People also agree that a microservice can be operated autonomously, so you should be able to, you know, um, boot it up and shut it down without affecting other microservices. But you can probably guess that that's where some of the complexity starts to arise. So I think that'll play a role later on as well. Something that I think people value a lot is the idea of being able to develop independently from one another, right? To be able to um, make uh, localized decisions to deploy independently from one another. So I want to be able to add a new feature to my microservice or maybe to make some technical internal change. And then I want to be able to deploy that into production. And I don't want to have to synchronize that with the deployment of other parts of the code. I want to be able to do that independently. That seems to be sort of the common stuff. But I do think the one thing where things really, really differ and the one thing I haven't really touched on, except maybe for the first thing, which was very vague, is the question of how big should those things be? How, what does it mean to do one thing and do one thing well? Is one thing, you know, one function? Is that a huge business capability? Is it something in between? So that's one what I'm going to talk about on, uh, during the next few minutes. So I'll start with uh, something that I consider sort of the... Uh, the smallest variant of microservices. If you take this example, then maybe your, your task is to implement a system that does some device event handling. There are millions maybe of devices out there in some complicated, very cool IoT scenario. And you get all those events sent into your system and you have to handle those little events and you decide to implement the logic, the business logic that's available as lots of very, very tiny, small pieces of code, each of them within their own boundaries, each of them may be deployed independently, each of them with their own logic, right? So examples could be you do some incoming event validation and then you maybe format that stuff or transform it into something else and then you generate new events, you aggregate them, you store them somewhere, you act upon them, right? All those little handlers, event handlers could all be little functions, which sort of gives the name to this particular style. I think this could be and maybe should be the original style of microservices. It's actually the only thing that really deserves the name microservice because those things are really tiny. What you can see here is that I've you know, just drawn some event bus infrastructure. I'm not talking about some sort of enterprise-wide ESB. I'm not talking about some high-performance thing that will be able to handle lots of these things and somehow connects the infrastructure, the messaging, the, the infrastructure to those little handlers. So that points us to some ideas about what it is that this architecture, this variant of the microservices architecture actually means for, for uh, the technical decisions that you'll end up making, right? So 
In this case, you'll have very, very small things like event handler style small functions. Each of them will be a few hundred lines of code or even less, maybe, maybe 20 lines is already too much, depending on your, on your taste in, in size here. They're typically triggered by events. Most of the communication is asynchronous, right? You get some trigger, you do something, and then maybe you fire off another event, and then something else happens somewhere else um, at some point in time. Um, I've seen this um, mostly, to be quite frank, either in theory or when other people talk about it. So my favorite person to talk about this kind of architecture is Fred George. You can research his stuff. He's awesome. There are some fantastic talks of his available on video. You can find them easily. And he talks about how behavior sort of emerges as a result from this. And of course, many of you will recognize this as sort of the a different way to talk about serverless architecture. Um, you know, like the uh, this idea of having this platform, of having this common fabric where you can just put in little functions that handle something where a lot of the a lot of the work is done by the actual infrastructure. So Lambda is one example, but there are of course alternatives to that. Google's and Microsoft's infrastructure as well. So the consequences of this approach are that you have this shared strong infrastructure dependency, right? So the serverless approach is a good example. If you, by serverless, you mean what's currently available with the cloud providers, right? You have a very strong dependency on that particular environment, you sort of go all in with that, and then you have very tiny things that sort of react to stuff. You might have common interfaces and multiple invocations of, you know, those same interfaces with different handlers, right? Because they all are registered to handle that particular or that kind of event. You'll have a lot of application logic in the actual configuration. So you could argue that you push a lot of complexity from the business logic to the uh, infrastructure or to the configuration of the infrastructure because the, the registration and the deployment of those event handlers is what actually determines the behavior of the system in the end. And you could call, call that emergent behavior, or you can just say, well, that's just another word for what the hell just happened, right? So if I'm if I'm a if I want to be, if I want to, you know, phrase this in a bad way or in a way that makes some people angry, I call this Oracle triggers on steroids, right? That's just the cool version of database triggers because it's, it shares a lot of similarities with that, right? You have the small things that you register, the database you register them maybe when something is inserted or updated or deleted. And in this particular case, you register when a message is received, it's basically the same thing. What makes it really cool is this thing that in the cloud can be built per request. So that's really cool. You don't pay for anything until you use it. Whereas on the other hand, you might end up with pretty unpredictable response times, in addition to pretty unpredictable or unexplainable behavior. So you might have guessed I'm not the biggest fan of this particular approach, but I do recognize it as extremely, as extremely cool. And I also think if you can get away with that, it is awesome. So if I'd be very interested if, many, if maybe some of you can point me to some more complicated systems I have some doubts as to the the limited complexity that this the boundary of complexity where this turns into something that's completely unmanageable and unwieldy but as i said i don't have any personal experience with this particular thing except for uh, mostly demo cases and proof of concepts so with that out of the way let's get to the most popular version i'll explain that again with a with an example so take a look at this at this e-commerce scenario. We have a product detail page. You want to display a page that displays information about one particular product in your maybe a shop solution or something, right? Then you have lots of different aspects that you need to combine to create that one particular view, right? Like the stuff mentioned here, the car product data, some description, maybe some reviews, some images, some related comment. And you, you sort of pull all of that together. Maybe you aggregate it on the way in multiple steps. And finally, you use some approach of orchestration to actually build up the final page, right? So what we have now is uh, the, this, this full, complete page of this particular product assembled by calling into multiple services. And if you're like me, an old person, this reminds you of something. Right? This is not something that was invented last year. In fact, it was very popular at the beginning of the century already, even before that. In the beginning of the century, we started to call it SOA, service-oriented architecture. So is that is microservices architecture and service-oriented architecture the same thing? No, I don't think so. But in this case, there are a lot of similarities, which is why I call this microSOA. So, what are those similarities here? I think there are some things that are sort of specific for microservices, like a small, small aspect, right? 
The self-hosted thing, so if you're, for example, in a Java environment, you'll find yourself having executable jars instead of a big application server, yes, like you used to have in the past. You also won't have big infrastructure like an ESB or some EAI platform or some other catastrophe like that. Instead, you'll try to get away with lightweight, hopefully open source tools. And of course, you're, you'll, um, you'll self-host and self-host those small things um, using something like containerized approach using Docker because everything's Dockerized these days. What reminds me, and what's similar to the uh, to the SOA approach, uh, to the SOA approach, is that you typically communicate synchronously. Right? You have a service calling a service calling a service, which sort of creates the, this these cascades of, of calls, which has a number of consequences. One is that you might end up doing some sort of streaming to get some parallel processing in this whole thing, um, and another one we'll get to in terms of complexity. You may have seen this, and you very likely will have seen this. Uh, popularized by a number of very big companies. One famous example, one very popular example is Netflix. Um, and I always like to say that I'm a, I'm a super big Netflix fan. I love the company. I use their product every day. So I really like them. And I'm totally fascinated by the engineering um, uh, excellence that they have. That is really awesome. The fact that they manage to scale stuff this way is really, really impressive. I'm not so sure I'm so thankful for the effect they have had on the microservices community because everybody seems to believe that that is the only way to do things. Um, and if you look at that from the consequences point of view, then there are a number of things that you might just want to accept, like you have these closely collaborating microservices, maybe that's fine, that's perfectly okay. But there are also some downsides. The fact that you've built stuff in, that you've cut apart stuff into these small things and connected them synchronously creates a huge need for, for some, some patterns to address the problem of, of, of um, instability, right? You have to find some stability patterns. Maybe you'll have circuit breakers, maybe you'll have libraries that'll do one way or the other of trying again. You'll need a lot of monitor, monitoring, you'll need a lot of replication and routing and load balancing and stuff because you want to make sure that your system works, even though when you look at it, there seems to be a high likelihood that at any point in time, it won't. You need a lot of redundancy to make that thing work. You end up with a very high cost of coordination, right? You have those things maybe deployed in multiple versions. You have to make sure that they're all still available. You have to make sure they are compatible somehow, even if they're running in multiple version, versions. It all creates very high infrastructure demand, which is probably fine, if you have a huge amount of resources to throw at that problem, both in terms of money, as well as in terms of human beings, software developers and other uh, engineers, um, lots of operations people. And if you don't mind paying a huge bill to your favorite cloud provider, then that might be, might be a way that could work. You often combine it with a streaming approach, which creates a lot of architectural complexity that I'm not going to get into right now. And if I want to be positive here, I would say that is probably and maybe even provably well suited to very, very extreme scalability requirements. So if what you do is build a video streaming portal for a billion people, then probably or maybe this is an excellent idea. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know you at all. Maybe that is the domain you're working in. I know that I'm not. I'm mostly working in domains that are a lot different. Um, they have other other kinds of complexity, but not that not that kind of scalability requirement. Even if they're internet-based based systems, very few of them have to scale to that level. So maybe this particular architecture, while working extremely well for somebody like Netflix, might not be the perfect choice for another company. Now, why why did I say that I'm sort of not that really thankful to to Netflix for this particular thing? I think because it sometimes created the illusion that people had done something that would that would decrease coupling, that would improve their decoupling, right? And that's what I like to call the decoupling illusion. It's a very common thing that I see in, in many in many projects these days. Essentially, you look at this at this landscape. You have all of these little microservices everywhere, and then you look at the stakeholders, and you notice that when they need something, and you could see some of that in Manuel's talk just before mine. If you look at them, then you find out they need something that spans more than one microservice, which is, seems kind of obvious, right? But you have different stakeholders who have overlapping needs, maybe just a tiny little bit, or maybe in a significant way. Now, if you look at that structure, then um, what you have not achieved 
is any sort of decoupling of the stakeholders. Now, maybe you think they don't matter. In my experience, they matter a lot because they are who drive what features are needed. They are who decide when what needs to go into production. So what will happen here is that you'll have meetings with different teams, with different groups to figure out who gets to do what first to one of those shared services. Reuse here, reuse of service logic is maybe not an asset. Maybe it's a liability. Maybe it's exactly not what you want to have here. And maybe the technical separation that you have here, the splitting apart of things into tiny little things only helps you if it actually helps you to isolate your stakeholders from each other. In fact, I think that's the case in most bigger projects. In most bigger projects, the issue is not scalability, is not runtime scalability. I mean, maybe it's an issue as well, right? I know we can mess that up dramatically. But most of the time when I look at systems and projects, the issue is actually development time scalability. It's being able to deliver things fast while the number of people who want to deliver something increases. And uh, just to make sure that you don't think this is just a business domain problem, right? And technologists and engineers don't have a problem. We can mess things up just as badly. So if we look at this other anti-pattern anti that I have here, I like to call it my, the micro platform. And I always show it like this and say, well, does this give you any hint what I'm, what I'm going to talk about? How about now? This is actually the, the situation where you have those all those little tiny microservices with their pseudo decoupling, and then you have some super smart technical person, typically the platform person or the platform team, create a common runtime environment for all of those things. And that essentially makes this one person a stakeholder in everything, because when they now update the central platform, then everybody has to update as well. I think that is not something you want to strive for. It is not something that is that is uh, that helps you, and that is why I think in most cases this will this is something to avoid. Right. I'll skip over the next one because I'm a little constrained for time here. I do want to talk about this pattern because I want to say something positive as well. I think ideally what we should strive for in a microservices architecture, and again this ties in nicely with Manuel's talk, I think. Um, what we should strive for is, some, is a situation where the teams are mostly autonomous, where the teams can do something end-to-end, -end, where the teams have responsibility for ideally some business capability that, they, that you can measure, where you can actually draw some conclusions from uh, the, 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 the measurements that you get when you deploy the new version and then apply that knowledge to correct something or add something new and then deploy again and check that again. That's fun, right? That's the way we want to develop software. We want to get software into the hands of our users, and get feedback, and then improve it. Um, so I think that is a that is a very strong case for, or rather, against projects, against product development, rather for you know long-standing service teams that actually deliver this thing for a longer time. But that is while that is an organizational thing, I'm firmly convinced that ideally it'll or. In general, it only has a chance to work if there is a strong relation to the actual architecture of the systems. That again is just Conway's law, right? If you have the systems aligned with the boundaries of the teams here, and of course, one team can have more than one system or service, but if you, if you, if you make sure that no two teams share a single system or a single service, then you actually get this parallel development capability in reality and not just in theory, because everybody can draw an org chart and claim that these two teams can act independently. If they have to synchronize their release schedule or something that they can't, then they can't act independently. They will have meetings. In my view, the number one goal of a microservices architecture is to be a meeting avoidance architecture. That's what you do not want to have. I don't want to have meetings, especially not with people from other teams. I want to go to lunch with my team, but I don't want to meet those other people and find a conference room or schedule one of those horrific Zoom calls with 100 people. I want to be in my small group because then I know that I'm, I'll be effective. Okay, so what does that mean for the sizing thing, which is the stuff we're talking about, right? So I think if we look at the sizing again, then we can move one step further in turn on, on our scale from small to, to big, right? Let's, let's increase the size a little bit again. Let's, let's increase the size a little bit again. If you look at this example, it's a logistics application, and I've separated out the front end. We'll get to that later. And, but now this is supposed to be, these are supposed to be a bunch of bigger chunks, right? These are things that are bigger and have more responsibility. So for example, something like order management, right? This is something like shipping, which is you know different things. One 
carries the or accepts the order from the client maybe with super high availability and another thing asynchronously to that handles the actual shipping of the orders maybe a route planning and invoicing and tons of other things those those uh, parts those contexts are share something they're connected they interact with each other but they also have a lot of uh, of uh, independence they have a lot of stuff that's local to them um, so in, in they're bounded in other words so you can guess where i'm, where I'm getting at. essentially those those are bounded contexts um, but to me bounded contexts well, at least when we talked about this with, uh, among my peer group when we talked about this we uh, we um, thought that DDD it has a the DDD bounded context has a has a meaning independent from the actual choice of the technical architecture that you use right even if you're building a single monolithic system in terms of deployment right a single deployment monolith you can still apply DDD inside and maybe that's that's just fine for you but if you use DDD bounded contexts or something similar to actually derive boundaries of your services then you end up with something that I like to call D DDD which is distributed DDD Right? It's essentially applying the knowledge from, from the domain driven design community, who hasn't invented it, but formalized it a bit, right? A, a, using the knowledge that people have gained over the last few decades and how to structure large systems and use that to structure your services. So it's still small, it's still self-hosted, it's still containerized and all that technical stuff, but it's now a little bigger than, than the small microservice, a lot bigger than the function, right? It's a it's bounded context sized, maybe at least we can argue a bit whether one or more bounded context should go into one of those services. It might use a lot of redundant data. So if you look at this example here, that's what I wanted to show with the colors, right? The, uh, for, for, to, be more, to be more independent, um, you accept some redundancy in data and logic, right? So that is the, that's the idea here. Um, you maybe use business events to do um, some stuff asynchronously, you handle incoming requests from the outside mostly within one of those services and then you fire up a number of events to notify others or do some behavior there there are lots of examples of that i don't have any popular ones like the ones that i mentioned before please tell me if you know some um, but I'm, I'm absolutely aware that there are a lot of companies and i know a few of our clients are building systems exactly this way right so when we build systems this way we essentially apply this stuff to the uh, to the core business layer and we get something that has different characteristics than what we talked about before. Most importantly, there's looser coupling, right? There's a and there's looser coupling between those contexts. That is so that is the goal, right? It acknowledges that those things have different speeds of evolution. The contexts evolve and they have their own stakeholders and their own business needs and their own, they make their own technology technological choices. That's all fine. They don't have to evolve in, in lockstep, which is the important thing. The asynchronous approach, you know, the eventing stuff between things increases st stability because now you can have one of those systems services up and running and it'll be able to service its consumers, right? So if I send a request to that service, it'll mostly at least be able to handle that internally on its own and it'll return a result. It doesn't have to invoke another service that invokes another service that invokes another service. Most of the time it can do whatever it needs to do locally as a consequence of the redundancy in data and logic. And then it'll fire off some events asynchronously, which allows for uh, a lot more stability just by the basic choice of things here. I think it's well suited for parallel, parallel development. And I think that is sort of the key thing here. If that's what you're looking for, then this is a much better approach than the super fine-grained other approaches that we talked about. Now, there's, there's one thing missing here, and that is what I think um, is, is really tragic in, in many projects, which is this view, right? That UI thing, the stuff that I mentioned, the front end part, that's obviously the easy part. I think only back end people tend to say stuff like that. And I won myself, right? I've over the over the over the years I've learned to respect the front end. And I think many architects need to learn that lesson still. Most of the time, the view that software architects just such as me have of the front end part is that's the small thing, right? Once we have those awesome services. The front end is going to be super easy. Somebody will just have to, you know, click a little bit and you know do some pretty pictures, and then they'll just they just build an app and everything will be fine. No, that's not what's going to happen. Typically, what happens when people don't take the front end seriously is they'll end up with something like this. In fact, they'll end up with multiple versions of this. They'll end up with multiple monolithic front ends 
that will all have overlap in business logic and not the good kind of redundancy, the bad kind of redundancy, the kind of redundancy that makes you go to three different teams to ask for the same change because you want all the UIs to be able to expose the same backend capability. So every time you want something new in that setup, from an organizational perspective, I don't have a slide for that, but if you, if you, if you translate this picture here into the equivalent number of teams, as I have uh, cubes here, then uh, you'll see that any significant change will require to talk to at least two teams, and if you have multiple front ends of this style, to every front end team and at least one of the back end service teams. Even if you have decided to build this back end services in that bound of context fashion, the DDDD fashion. So let me go to my last example, which is my next to last example, which is this e commerce site. So assume that you have a site where, you know, just maybe like on Amazon.com, you can shop for stuff. Then you could imagine that something like registering, maintaining your account is separate from browsing the catalog, which is separate from actually checking out a product or actually uh, buying and paying for a product. Those are all different parts in the user journey, if you want to. Um, but that's not even the critical point. The critical point here, you could design them as independent end-to-end -end services or systems or apps, right? So the, the vertical lines, the vertical lanes that I have here uh, actually um, are supposed to symbolize both the back end and the front end part with the front end uh, at the bottom for some weird reason that I can't remember. And then when you go about things this way, you actually have the task of connecting stuff, of course, because you have to, you know, find a way to get those things to talk to each other. But now there's a new option because each of those things has its own front end. You can now connect the front ends. And it turns out that magically the web has a way to do that, which is this magic concept called a link. So if you go from one web front end to the other web front end, there's a pretty straightforward way to integrate stuff, right? And you can do that in multiple directions and you can embed stuff and maybe even transclude stuff, which essentially means that you that you uh, introduce a little part of one system as sort of a preview into another. Just think, for example, of a shopping cart when that shows you the number of items in your shopping cart. And if you click on it, you go to that other system that actually maintains or handles maybe the checkout. Sorry, click once too fast. The idea here is that this is a little bigger than the other. It's even bigger than the, uh, or in a different direction than the DDDD part. We like to call this SCS for self-contained systems. Um, that's just a name we pick because these kinds of microservices are really not microservices and they're also really not micro, they're not services and they're not micro, right? They're bigger, they're mostly systems because they have a front end included and they're so big that it's hard to really just call them services. But it's perfectly fine, there's still a variant of this particular thing. So self-contained autonomous, but now including the database and the UI and everything that you need to actually have a completely running application. Let's ignore the third part for a moment. You can find some examples of that. In fact, I would claim that Amazon is a good example of that, even though they, of course, do not use this term. But if you look at Amazon.com's website, .co.uk's website, then you can you can you can actually notice that it's different teams who have built different parts of the system. Because if you, if you move from one part to the other, you can actually sometimes see a subtle change, and not sometimes not so subtle change, in the user interface, in the way things look, and you notice that it doesn't really you know, disturb you in any way. It doesn't hurt you in any way because this mostly happens when you change contexts. And every time you change context, the page change is perfectly fine. So that is another common pattern here. In this particular model, we have these larger independent systems um, also able to autonomously serve requests, but now end to end. It's not just a service request. It's not an incoming API call that they can serve. They can handle a user interaction. Doesn't matter what kind of front end technology you choose here. The idea is that a user interaction will be handled by this one particular system and also by that one particular team, which is a really cool idea if you think about it. If I just have a backend service that, for example, provides a way for a client to maybe for a consumer to access their profile, then everybody who wants to use that service will have to build some sort of UI for that. If that UI belongs to the team that actually builds that service, everybody can just reuse that UI. And ideally, that team would be able to change that UI and the others would still just include or link to or transclude whatever the integration choice is that you're making. Um, 
So that lightweight integration is a critical thing here. It's not the only thing that you can do. Of course, you have all the other options as well. That's perfectly fine. But you have this additional option now that you've included the front end in your considerations here. And many times, you don't need extra infrastructure because basically, you're just building web applications. We won't go into too much detail about that particular one. And I think it's perfectly suited if your goal is actual decoupling of development teams. Uh, uh, that's my personal experience from a number of projects where we have used this approach. You actually end up with a with a very nice way of doing things here. Let me skip over the next few again in the interest of, of time. Let me switch to this one. This sort of, and I want to open up to a bit of discussion with this with this last thing here. Um, first of all, I like this picture a lot. I also like the mathematical concepts here, which is called fractal nature of things, right? So if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, you can see more of the same all the time. And that in general is true for, for building blocks as well. So it doesn't really matter what it is that you choose to use for modularization, whether it's um, modules or components or services or systems, they so somehow always nest, right? You always have more of them in between and you have to figure out what the right strategy is here. So I think that is a, also a very important thing. And if you consider the, the journey that we went from very small to larger and larger, then there's just one thing missing, right? So what is the, what is the ultimate size of things or the, the largest size of things that we should consider? And I dare to, you know, dig out this big, big thing here, which is the dreaded monolith. Of course, monoliths have become a bad thing. Only now people are saying again that maybe monoliths aren't so bad at all. Maybe this whole microservice idea wasn't that great. I think the microservice idea was great and still is great. But that does not mean that monoliths don't, don't have a place. First of all, in many cases, and I can tie that to Manuel's mentioning of the discussion that we had about you know wh whether you should start with a monolith or start with microservices. There are certain cases where you should definitely start with a monolith. For example, if you're building something uh, for the very first time to test the market, right? If it's something that you just want to get out as fast as possible to get into the hands of some clients, some end users, to get feedback from them as to whether it's a good idea to build that at all. Any thoughts that you waste here on super scalable things or hundreds of people working in parallel, this, that is just complete nonsense. First, prove that you are that you have a valuable idea and that somebody wants it, and then you can consider it that second part. So that ties it to my second thought. If you do know that you want to build this thing, and if you do know the domain, and if you do know what it is that you're building, then it's not a good idea to start with a monolith when you want to end up with microservices, because it's really, really hard to refactor a monolith into a system built of microservices. So that, those are the two th sides of the thing. Also, a, micro, a monolith has a natural size limit. The problem is that nobody knows what it is, right? So you'll, sometimes you'll hit that limit and um, you'll notice it's too late to do anything about it. But there is a good size. There is a good size monolith. In fact, I like monoliths a lot. And you could go back to my la last slide and argue that I love monoliths so much that I'm suggesting you build multiple of them, right? Build many of them, build them sort of at the right size and decide when it's time to build the next one, then connect them. Right? In fact, this ties, I think, to some... Who hit the mute button? Was that me? That is weird. Didn't I wave my hands around? But you can hear me again, right? OK. So maybe somebody accidentally muted me. Um, should I start again with a slide? Or how far did you understand me? You write it in the chat. I can see it. OK. Until previous slide. So I'll start. Maybe you heard some of that monolithic rant that I did before, right? Was that okay? Okay, so let me start here with this particular slide again. So if you, uh, if you assess the size of a problem by the number of developers needed to attack it, 
then uh, you can see that you will need different means of decoupling, different means of modularization, depending on that size. If it's just you building something on your own, then it's perfectly fine to not use anything at all, or maybe just do with some methods of functions or procedures, just maybe in a single file, a single executable. If you, if you move up, if you go further to the right, then maybe you will need some modules or maybe even some components as different levels of decoupling, right? With more complexity, with more cost to pay for an additional benefit in more decoupling or less coupling, if you prefer. And of course, at some point in time, you'll hit something like microservices because those are a means of decoupling that is better in the sense of less coupled, more decoupled than components. That's what we learned, right? With components, you still did a common component runtime. You have lots of uh, dependencies between the components and that hurts your ability to move forward. For example, when you want to modernize something, if you have separate microservices, those things become easier. You could scale easier. You can modernize more easily but you pay with an extra overhead and in infrastructure. What I'm saying is that this is not the end, right? There is something beyond that, and maybe there are lots of shades in between, and those are actual systems. I think you should think about the systems that you build just as you think about the services or the components and the modules. And of course, those compose fractally, right? You could decide, if you look at a big problem, to build three systems, and then decide that one of those systems uh, could be built internally with microservices. Another one will just be built in a monolithic fashion, and that's perfectly fine. So that is sort of the, the general thing, and this is sort of the, the general truth that you'll find everywhere, right? Separate separate things, cut them apart, and join the stuff that belongs together, which is sort of the very obvious thing. So let me leave you with a few takeaways that I think are important when you consider this science discussion. First one is there is more than one way, right? There's not just one thing. Not one of them is the true microservices and the other ones are not. It's fine to pick any one of them. And which one you pick very, very strongly depends on what it is that you want, right? What is what's the goal? Why did you pick them in the first place? I hope you didn't pick them because you heard about them at a conference or because you want to improve your CV. Maybe those are valid reasons for some people, but it's not what I think are good reasons in terms of architecture or business outcome. So if your goal is to have a mostly simple thing scale super high, then you will choose something different than if it's something that is very, very complex from a business perspective, domain perspective, and you need to just scale it reasonably. And you will choose different things depending on whether you want to have runtime scalability or development time scalability. Very often, you need to figure out how much autonomy you actually want to have. I didn't have much time to go into that, but if that ties again to the previous talk. Right, you, this is a means of deciding uh, how independent people can be. Right, and, and architecture and organization structure always influence each other, and you have to be aware of that and decide what you want to do. Also, I am a big fan of evolvable structures, so whatever you choose, think of that. Right, think of how your architecture can uh, can maintain some integrity even in the face of changes. Right, if you if you make lots of technology choices that sort of leak into everything everywhere, then you are married to those technology choices. And if they become unpopular, your system will become unpopular. And that may mean nobody will want to work on it anymore, nobody will support it anymore, it will, won't get the cool new features, it won't be the hot new thing, so maybe that's not something that you want. Ideally, you should have an architecture that can stay the same over two decades because you cheated and actually made the evolvability the actual architectural key tent. And that's all I have. Thanks for listening and sorry for the glitch in between. I hope it was still tolerable and useful. Okay, I'll stop sharing the screen and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Excellent, thanks for that, Stefan. We have a, a question already. Um, any lessons learned or best practices can be shared, please, to implement microservices? And another one is, a delivery director, how can I measure teams' performance towards microservices, any KPIs or metrics? Yeah, that is. those are both good questions. So the first one regarding uh, implementation of microservices, um, I think there are many choices that work. I've seen many different technology choices in terms of micro-architecture, right? If you decide what the overall structure is, what you, what you want to build,
then uh, you want to give some choice to the individual teams and they hopefully can, within the limits of the organization and the culture and the skill transfer needs, whatever it is, you will give them some leeway, some, some uh, flexibility. And I've seen teams and my colleagues choose uh, things from Go and Java.net uh, over Node.js and um, tons of different, tons of different, tons of different things, right? So I think basically with any modern infrastructure, with any modern microarchitecture and programming language, you can build those things. So it's mostly a choice of a matter of culture and knowledge and the people that what they, what do they like best? That plays such an important role. I wouldn't force a team to use something that they hate because they're, they're going to build uh, uh, shit. And I would suggest that they pick something that they like and that they know well, or something that they want to try and experiment with. And microservices have the great benefit that they give you a chance to try out stuff. So you can say, well, hey, build that microservice with that new thing, but those other five, they're too important. They're going to be built with our standard mainstream technology. As to the second question regarding the uh, the KPIs, I think um, this this third and fourth option, the fourth specifically, which I'm a big fan, of course, actually give you um, the great chance to measure the team's performance by the business outcome, which is infinitely better than measuring it by some artificial KPI, right? So I've I've seen a, a system that was about uh, credit applications, loan applications, and uh, people. Uh, measured their success uh, by the um, by the closing rate of new loans. Now, maybe that is a it's from an ethical perspective, maybe not a good thing. Maybe you don't. But if you if you assume that it's in the business in the business's uh, uh, goals and perfect and values, perfectly fine to um, convince people to um, uh, apply and close a loan deal, then that is an excellent measurement for the team that does that. And I've seen the same thing, for example, for teams that an e-commerce system handled the checkout process and found ways to improve things so that fewer people stopped during stopped purchase the purchase during checkout see so in the financial systems insurance systems lots of ways where you can actually get business benefits as measurements for a team's success and that's much better than any technical thing that you can that you can find Any other questions, Oliver? I don't we see. Any don't seem to have any other questions for now. Anybody else have a? Oh, here we go. Um, a question about the clients. Even though dividing the clients into different parts owned by different teams, they often share a common UI component library, which causes tight coupling. What's your view on that? That is a that is an excellent observation. That is very true. So. Um, uh, that is something that just needs to be managed and you have to make up your mind whether you want to accept that or not and what and you need to be aware of the consequences so i've seen this turn out really badly where essentially all the all the intended autonomy was ruined by too much centralization in the front end part in theory all the teams could have released independently but in practice there was such a sophisticated front-end optimization and bundling scheme that required all the front-end components or the front-end parts, the front-end application parts built by the different teams to be mangled together and then, you know, deployed together into production. And that essentially meant that they all had to synchronize their work anyway. So that was the thing gone bad. I've seen it go well when the, when the UI parts were more in the sense of a pattern library or component library, something that was offered to teams. And it's very good to have something like that in a structured and well-designed and consistent fashion because I as an end user don't care for your microservices architecture at all. I don't want to know anything about that. I want to see a consistent look and feel. But consistent does not mean 100% in sync. Um, again, I, I hesitate to use Amazon as a good example, as an example of good UI design. But if you look at Amazon and you go from one one part to the other, you notice that it's the same branding, it's clearly the same company, it's the same colors, the same fonts, the same icons, but it's not exactly the same, right? There is some, there are some differences. And if you imagine several teams working simultaneously, all updating to the new version of the style guide or pattern, li pattern library um, or component library uh, when, they, when they can, um, you will have some change, some, some differences, but they'll be tolerable and they'll be fine and you can sort of decide how much uh, how much centralized control again it comes down to that issue right how much centralized control do we have do you want to have to keep everything 100 consistent 
uh, versus how much autonomy and parallel um, evolvability do you want to have? And then you make a choice that matches your organization's need, and that works pretty well in my experience. So there's a new next, one, right? Yeah, next question. Um, where or who do the shared concerns for architecture sit with in such an environment with independent teams doing end-to-end -end delivery? That's also a brilliant question, right? And it basically has the same answer. It's just, you know, ask from the from the other end of the spectrum. And we're just talking about the front end part where this is important, but this is also important from, from the back end part, the overarching architecture. Um, and all of the, you always have this, you always have this discussion and this this uh, this tension between centralization and autonomy, right? Do you want to you want to have something centralized? Let's say, for example, you're in a tightly regulated market, most markets these days are, and you have some compliance issue and you have some procedure to follow and you have some assessments to make and maybe you even have some audit process, whatever. If you have those things, then you can't just wish them away. They're, they are there and they will have to be addressed. And then you will have to figure out a good way to address them without hurting autonomy too much. And again, that very much depends on the overall structure. My suggestion would be uh, first of all, follow the law. That's a good idea. Follow all the law and laws and regulations because there's no way around that. But if it's not a law, if it's not a formal compliance rule, then think very hard about every single rule because every single rule means you need to enforce it. You need to figure out a way to do that. Only standardize and only mandate what's really worth it, like the stuff that is needed to get things to connect at all. Maybe something like, the single sign-on procedure, maybe the UI consistency, maybe something like, but only maybe the um, some operations aspect like the cloud platform or the monitoring or whatever it is, right? They would start to think: Do I want that, or do I even do I want the independence of each team to make their own choices, right? Every time you make a a, a well-intended choice, like let's standardize on this database product, right? Every time you do that you take away options from, from teams who might have made better choices if you hadn't decided that. So I'm not saying it's bad, it really depends, but you should be aware of this tension and I think you clearly are, otherwise you wouldn't ask that question. So it's a non-answer, but it's a very good question I can, I can give you that. You're welcome. Excellent. Any, any further questions for Stefan? Okay, so maybe let me say, if you, uh, same as Manuel said, right, I'm easy to find, please uh, send me your questions or your connection requests on LinkedIn or Twitter or any other social network except Facebook. You can also find uh, an scs-architecture.org website, should be easy to find self-contained systems that has a lot of links and information. Of course, I'll provide the slides so that you can uh, check them out as well. Excellent. We'll give it a give it a little bit longer, just in case anybody does have another question. There'll be a bit more time to type your question in. Uh, there we go. Um, at what scale in a company can you support such autonomy? I.e., a team can choose their own architecture technology to use. Right. So uh, again, very very applicable and, and useful question. Um, first of all, I think uh, most of what I've discussed about is from the perspective of somebody working for larger organizations, right? So if you're a small organization, and we do work for them as well, right? If you're a small organization that has like five or 10 developers, don't worry too much about this stuff. Because that is, it really addresses big parallel development uh, or big scalability issues, which you're not likely to have in either, either case. And then some of that stuff is simply not applicable. But I do think it's applicable in larger organizations. Now, of course, you hit an upper boundary as well, right? What is the what is the maximum size? I don't think there's a maximum size. I think the rules change. If if we work for big conservative companies, let's say a German insurance company, a few things more conservative than a German insurance company, if you work for them, then uh, they will never accept every team uh, being allowed to do whatever they like. That's simply not, that is, they don't work that way, right? That is not their culture. That's not a, that's completely impossible. But that does not mean that every team has to use 100% exactly the same thing. 
In fact, I would always consider that to be an anti-pattern because 100% the same thing would mean that you standardize the whole company and all the software development happening there on one particular version of your programming language frameworks, libraries. And that is simply ridiculous. That It can't work that way. In fact, many, many clients have a problem because they tried to do too much of that, because they wanted to standardize too much, they now have these huge systems that they only can move from one WebSphere version to the next, or from one Oracle version to the next, which always is a huge multi-million line of codes migration project. If you allow for at least some difference in that regard between individual teams, then they can move in their own pace, at least with version upgrades. And whether you want to extend that to maybe, let's say, in a Java shop, you allow them to not only develop Java, but also other Java or JVM-based languages, or in a .NET shop, the same thing on the .NET platform, maybe that's OK. Maybe your, maybe your way of doing things is you allow for these three options. You either pick uh, Java, or you go with C Sharp, or you go with Go. Those are the three options. What, what's, what works for you depends on the organization and its culture. And so you don't have to let everybody do anything they like, um, but you can give them uh, options and, and freedom, a little bit more freedom than they used to have in the past, and they will thank you for it. Excellent. Um, next question. How do you see the future of microservice architectures? Are we on the brink of any new innovations? disruptive approaches or technologies? Yeah, so it's always very hard to predict the future, of course. So I'm not sure I have the answer to that. What I do think is that, um, and again, I'm sometimes, sometimes I think maybe it's a sign of me getting old. So maybe you should take that with a grain of salt. But I have this feeling that my patience for, for yak shaving has continuously decreased over the years. I take less and less pleasure out of fiddling with technology for technology's uh, own sake. And um, so I, I, I basically I'm just bored when I have to, you know, just get the next thing to work. That doesn't bring me one step closer to my actual business goal. It just brings me a little closer to knowing more about Kubernetes, or whatever it is, right? So I'm not sure the fact that we now fiddle with so much technology on that scale is a good sign. And that is, long story short, that is why I have some hope for environments that are uh, on a higher level, that give me more of a, uh, of a maybe hosted web-based development environment without sacrificing productivity and good software engineering. I'm not saying that, but something that takes away all of these layers for me and maybe uses them internally, but I don't care about that. I want to develop on a, on a higher platform. Like the platform as a service idea, but done well this time. That I think would be an awesome development that I think it would help a lot of people. Um, there was a, a very interesting language called Dark. You can find it at darklang.com. Fascinating idea. Sadly, the, the, the person developing it has lost funding, so he's just now doing it on his own. So I don't know how much, how much future it has. But the basic concept was you develop on that platform in a specific language, built for building services. You have no idea what the underlying infrastructure is because that's the way it should be. I like that concept a lot, and maybe we'll see more of that. But it's, that's definitely the future. I don't know of anything right now. OK. Um, the next question, I'm a, a little unsure again. What is the best event bus infrastructure? I think the next word would be uh, creation advice for people in a small company. Yeah, so again, that strongly depends right, on your infrastructure. So there are different uh, solutions when you are um, in uh, in the Java space versus the .NET space, or if you're in a space where you don't care about those things. So I've seen very successful projects using something like Kafka. I've heard very good things about end service bus, even though I've never used it for anything myself. Um, I uh, I don't have any personal I have personal story to relate here. Mostly, most of my uh, event bus infrastructure experience it was either horrible because it was horribly bloated products that are sadly no longer fashionable. Um, or it was something more arcane, like a you know a JMS-based thing that's no longer popular. But if I listen to my colleagues who do more of the actual work in the actual projects, then Kafka seems to be something that seems to work very well for a lot of people. Again, I would hope some, to get something like that in a hosted fashion. Um, but yeah, excellent. Which means you've you've asked sort of answered the next question, which was what do you think about Kafka? <laughs> oh, yes. Cool. Um, 
All right, lovely. We'll give it uh, give it a little bit longer. Just whilst we have a, a bit of a pause, if anyone does have another question, please do um, jump in with your questions. In the meantime, just to say, anybody else who is thinking about speaking or would like to speak at this meetup, Dario and I both are always on the lookout for speakers. Um, obviously, we've got next year to plan for. If you have a long-term goal of speaking at a meetup, even if you are a first-time speaker, please do get in touch. Dario um, is much more technical than I am. I'm a, I'm a recruiter by trade, so I won't be much good helping you build the, a technical talk for our audience. Um, but Dario would would actively get involved in coaching first-time speakers. So, um, And I must say that some of the most popular speakers that we've had have been people speaking for the first time. So don't let a lack of experience speaking in a meetup hold you back. If you have a goal of, of doing more public speaking and doing presenting, this meetup is a very good place to start. As we have a friendly audience, um, so do get in touch and, and would love to help you on that, start that journey. Uh, we have another question. Is there any one prerequisite for going from monolith to microservices? So in general, I think going from a monolith to a microservice is really, really, really hard. It is typically, if it's a significant system, a multi-year project. And you, you should think very, very thoroughly about whether you really want to do that. Because you can only do it if you have enough management backing and if you have a good strategy and if you have good reasons for doing so. Sometimes um, going from monolith to microservices essentially means a rewrite, which is sometimes a very good idea. But just again, you should be aware of that. I don't think it's an easy thing. You don't, in my experience, refactor an existing system to microservices. That simply doesn't happen. You change it to microservices over the course of time, or you replace it with one that uses a microservice architecture. It doesn't really matter which of the variants that I mentioned you use. That's sort of always the case. Which is coincidentally why I have a problem with Simon's, uh, the one that you mentioned, Manuel, right? The, the, the statement from Simon. I love him to pieces. He's awesome. He's fantastic. Great speaker. Awesome content. I, he really is he's awesome. But in this particular aspect, I think he's wrong. Because if it were so easy to build a modular monolith, if we were also great at building modular systems, then we wouldn't need microservices. Microservices are not something you graduate to once you know how to build perfect uh, modular monoliths because there's no point. There would be no point in doing that. You, there are means that you use because you suck at building modular monoliths and you want to be better at that. So that is, that's my continuous beef with him, but I'm sure it would be <laughs> nice. I don't know what your opinion, Manuel, on that, on that topic. So. That makes sense. I hadn't thought about it from that point of view, but yes, probably that's what history is trying to tell us. You're really not going to get much better at modular monoliths. Yeah. Um, another question is from Naveed. How about service mesh? Ah, OK. So I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, we do actually have a website called servicemesh.es. So if you look at servicemesh.es, you'll find a comparison of service meshes, probably a number of links. So some of my colleagues are extremely active in that space, and they have made a quite good experience. I think the value of a service mesh increases with the complexity of the infrastructure that you need for your stuff. So if your system overall is pretty straightforward, maybe it's built out of three or five self-contained systems, then maybe you don't need something like that, and that is a good thing. It is good if you don't need a service mesh. But if you do need something like a service mesh, then they're awesome because it's really, really hard to build something like, like that from, uh, from scratch yourself. And they have a lot of good concepts. There are a lot of alternatives like Istio and Linkerd and many more. And um, again, before you build something like that yourself, consider them. But don't, again, don't start with that, right? Don't, don't pick a service mesh because that's cool and then look for a problem that might be usable uh, or that might be applicable to to a service mesh, it should always be the other way around, right? You should have the complexity and a good reason for the complexity, and then a service mesh can be a great help. 